Good morning. It's time for us to start our class. Thanks, uh, thanks to everyone that's here this morning, whether you are here in the auditorium or you're online uh, listening to the class, or uh, as time goes by, if uh, sometime later in the week or today, whatever it might be, that you have the opportunity to look at our lesson today, uh, particularly those that may be at home and cannot uh, easily make it out here to us, we I want you to know that we're thinking of you and praying for you and I want you to know that we appreciate anyone that takes the time to look at our class and we hope that the things that we go over can be of such that can help all of us to be better people. We will be uh, today uh, just a few questions left in chapter 2 of Genesis and then we'll get right into Genesis 3. Uh, so that's where we'll be doing. We're in a, now we started a study. For those who may not know, we started a study of Genesis and uh, looking at it, and we're dealing with questions that come out of the different verses in each chapter. And um, so that's uh, how our class is designed to go right now. Now, in our uh, newsletter, in our newsletter uh, bulletin thing here, we have a few points we'd like to uh, bring up. Um, we, as you know, we have a couple of our members under uh, some form of hosp hospital or care such as that. Billy Glenn, he's home now, and he has to have an IV, and Jenny is giving them to him twice a day. And our sister Faye White Rice, you know, fell uh, several weeks back and broke her arm, is, is under uh, care at her home. Uh, and then uh, Marty Dixon is the mother of Greg Dixon's home recovering, Mary Ellison. Uh, sister of Betty Thomas is under hospice care in Childersburg. Uh, David Hendricks, husband of Teresa Hendricks, is home from the hospital, but his O2 level still require him to be on oxygen. Uh, Amy Locke, daughter of Carol Mitchell, underwent surgery Friday and is currently recovering. Danny Mills, former member here, uh, currently uh, current goals are to continue weaning from ECMO uh, machine and to walk unassisted. Uh, Danny's been up there three or four months now, somewhere like that, so he's had a very tough time, but he's, he's uh, trying his best, I know, to get uh, well enough to where he can come home. Anita Nix, also a former member from years ago, surgery, removed a large portion of cancer. She'll undergo chemo uh, treatments for the rest of it. Bill Rager is a friend of Legita Mara, being diagnosed with cancer, and there is an address for him in Cullman. I know he, uh, they would appreciate cards for anyone to be willing to send those. Angela Scott, mother of Blake Scott, is slowly getting better. And Joe Williams, former member and preacher for us years ago, is a heart and pulmonary fibrosis is worsening. And so he's in Amory, Mississippi. Also, next Sunday uh, morning, um, we'll see if you uh, did your due diligence the night before uh, daylight savings time, boo-hoo. I'm going to lose an hour of my daylight unless I want to get up real early, which I do sometimes, but we have to set our clocks back, you know, spring forward in the spring and fall back in the, in the fall. So um, if you would, be sure to do that Saturday night. Or if you want to wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and do it, you're welcome to do so. All right. Uh, and, and don't forget down under here our uh, homebound members that we have the list there. So please remember all of them. Um, and then on the other side of the opening there, uh, the dinner is served uh, area right there. November 3rd, uh, we will begin serving dinner at 6 p.m. to any member that would like to participate. The cost will be $5 a person, ages 10 and older. The younger ones will eat for free. This in um this week, we'll have chicken and dumplings, a fruit, dessert, as well as a sandwich fixings. And what this is for, we hope that this will eliminate some of the stress and rush trying to feed our families while trying to get them to church on Wednesday night. We do have members uh, that have to pick their kids up for certain things, and they don't, may not live close by. And this is a great way for us to, uh, anyone that would like to, it's a good time to fellowship. It's fun. Now, if you can stand the noise, if you can stand the noise, that's great. <laughs> I love hearing the noise. That's always a good sign. So it's a good thing. The food is good it's, uh, uh, for those that would be interested in coming uh, for that. To be honest with you, even if you were to come on Wednesday morning to class, um, for $5 to eat what 
on, on that list, it's pretty cheap. So you can eat and go home, <laughs> whichever way you want to do that. Um, also, today is the fifth Sunday. And as you know, we normally do what we call church, eat church, and we'll do that today. But our fall festival and trunk, our treat, will be this afternoon. Uh, actually, our evening worship service starts at 2, and then from 3 to 5 is the uh, uh, trunk or treat outside. Uh, this evening, the young, our young men will be doing our evening service for us, and then the, after services, the uh, children have time to change their clothes, and uh, then there'll be the vehicles lined up outside like we've done before. And um, we're planning on eating at the pavilion this afternoon. It'll be out in the open air. Uh, should be a very nice afternoon. I think it's going to be pretty nice if you would like to come and do that too. And so that's for that. Um, also uh, on our birthday list, on the, other, the next page there, you'll see that today Heather Ellis uh, and then uh, Tuesday, Mr. Randy Swift. And Glenn Taylor will be uh, having a birthday. And then Dennis Harbin on the 7th, Grant Corcoran. And then Kate Farmer will be uh, having a birthday on the 8th. Is that right? I hope. Oh, it was October. This is October. Oh, that's right. Uh, it's always an adventure for me when I get up every day. I'll go ahead and tell you right now, it's an adventure. But uh, happy birthday again, Kate. How's that sound? And Randy, happy birthday to you again. <laughs> but anyway, sorry about that. But we appreciate everybody. That's, I've always said it's better to have a birthday than not to have one, you know, and so we can still be with each other. But right now, we're going to ask our brother Joe to come and lead us in prayer, and then we'll start a class. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the occasion that brings us together. We might have an opportunity to study from Thy Word. I guess I bless us to be with, with Brother John today. He brings us lessons from Genesis. He, he might say those things that would be most beneficial for each of us to live better and become closer to Thee. We ask that blessing to continue with us, be with all of those of whom it is our duty to pray, those who are mentioned here in the bulletins, as friends, uh, friends and family, and those that uh, extended family that we know, each individual. That blessings would be directed to them and their infirmities would be cared for as that would have them to be. We recognize these as being the most Sovereign God, and we thank Thee for the opportunity that we have from time to time to come before Thee and petition Thee. And our effort is always to be good stewards in Thy kingdom, and we ask for that encouragement to, in that direction. And be with us through this remainder of this service year as, as we study from God's Word. And now unto Him to whom we live and move and have our being. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we're going to look uh, we're going to be looking at um, chapter two, and it's going to be we're going to drop back just for a moment to uh, the 28th question, and this is about when God uh, to, uh, uh, prior to this. As you can see, what did God take out of Adam? As you remember, Adam, prior to this, had had the opportunity to name all the animals. And all, them, all they came before him. And so what happened when God saw that, that uh, all the animals uh, had other animals to be with, he, he said that, you know, that uh, man didn't need to be alone. And so he saw that he was alone at that time. So he wanted to create a, a helper or helpmeet, uh, a partner, what we might say today, 
uh, for him, a companion, so that he would not be alone. You know, our, uh, in, our, in our world, we as people, we really need to have interaction with other people. Now, there are sometimes I feel sure, if you're like me, you really might not want to interact with some people, but humans need interaction with other humans, and God knew that, and so he did that. So what did God take out of Adam in verse 21? He uh, took out one of his ribs, as we mentioned last week. After God took out the rib, what did he do? What did God do? And I thought this was a very compassionate thing uh, for God, is this, uh, that the Scriptures tell us that he closed up the flesh in that place. And so he, uh, he opened Adam, took the rib out, and then closed it back up so he could heal back up. And so hopefully that lets us know that's, that is another example of how God cares for all of us. And then the next question, what did the Lord do with the rib from Adam in verse 22? The answer is fashioned a woman. Now, as I said earlier, I use the uh, New American Standard Version, so sometimes if, you have, if, you have, if you've had the opportunity to answer these questions beforehand, your version may not have the same word, but if it does, um, that's fine. Uh, if it doesn't, that's fine too. But fashioned a woman. Now, if you notice how... It says here in this version, fashion. That's pretty, pretty good. Uh, and then it says woman. So what does women like a lot? Fashion, don't they? That's supposed to be a joke, but it wasn't much of one. I'm sorry about that. But he fashioned a woman. He made a woman. He, he made one that would be a benefit to man is what he did. After the Lord God fashioned a woman, what happened next? Um, he brought her to man. As we said last week, if you remember, I believe that we did, that for whatever reason, God, of course, we, we knew that God had put Adam to sleep and did this. He may have been still asleep, and then he woke him up. We don't know. But anyway, God brought her uh, to him. Uh, what had been done to create her had been done away from Adam, and so he brought her to him, which might have been kind of symbolic in a sense is that the animals other, all the other things that are being created have been brought to Adam and then this other thing, but it's going to be for him, for his helpmate. And God brought her to, to him. And uh, why call her woman? Uh, in verse 23 it says, because she was taken out of man. Taken out of man. And so that was why she was called that. Um, one of the first times that we've had an explanation of a word uh, that would be in the Bible. Uh, and then uh, in verse 24, when a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, they become what? And, uh, and it says one flesh. Now again, we need to remember, if we were to look at the first two chapters of Genesis as, they, as the writer was actually writing it at the moment it happened, this would not make sense. This, this would not make sense because talking about a man leaves his father and mother. There's, there's not any children yet, as you know. So, but anyway, again, this was written 1,000, 1,500 years or so from what people have tried to figure out afterwards. Well, by that time, man, mankind, there was many men and women and children and families and communities and so forth like that, tribes, whatever it might be. It was a, many like that. And so by then, they would have known about the fact of, of, of leaving a family and finding your mate, your friend, your companion, one that you would be together. Um, and so by then, they would have known about this. And so and it's also important here that we can see that it talks about one flesh doesn't mean they become just one body and, and just one thing or one person. It's that, that they work together to create that situation to where they can be, in a sense, one is what they can be. And it's, uh, we strive to do that. We will see, uh, in, even in the, in the Bible, that doesn't always work out, but uh, uh, it, it, the hope uh, was that. Because we have to remember, at the beginning uh, of mankind, not only were, were man and woman put here, but they were also told to multiply the world. And so that was part of it to uh, do that. So one flesh. 
I believe that is the last question in that. Now, what you have today, if you have that, you have uh, lesson number three. Our, our chapter number three is what we have. And I apologize. I've been trying to get, get these to where you have them a week before, but somehow or another. Well, after what I just did a while ago with announcements, you can understand why I didn't do it last week. But... Um, uh, we will kind of go along and do these together. But this right here, chapter 3 of Genesis, sadly, talks about the fall of man. The fall of man. Now, of course, even up into this chapter, we will see that uh, God had planned, at least from what we can see, as far as the writer tells us, and being uh, guided by the Holy Spirit, that... Um, uh, God not only made man and woman, but he made them to have choices. And we will see this. He will give them choices in their life, and uh, then they must decide on their own. So uh, the fall uh, of man. Uh, the first question is this. Uh, who was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made? And this is found in the first verse. And it is the serpent is how it is. Um, you, some of you may have the devil. It may be like it, or Satan, whatever it may be. I'm not sure. But if you would, notice this. Even when man was made, who was already there? And Satan was. And so there was God that created all good and wonderful things. And then, of course, we find out over in Revelation some history about Satan and the devil and how he became to be where he was and what he was. But uh, we see that even at the beginning that, that uh, he had the opportunity to be there. If you notice the word crafty in this uh, version of the Bible, I think is very uh, appropriate. Look um, in our world uh, from the time that we've had history all the way up to now, that Satan has used things against man that are part of man uh, to cause him to sin. Um, you know, the pride of life and so forth like that. So we can see uh, that he is a trick person. He knows the human person so well that what things that can get our attention away from God is the things that if we're not careful can be the main focus in a person's life. And so we don't want to be able, to, we don't want that. We want to be able to do those things that are right and good uh, from God. Now, in a question number two, the serpent asked the woman a question. Indeed, God said, you shall not eat from blank tree of the garden. <clears throat> Is how I worded this question. And the answer for that, now, first of all, if you notice this, before we see the answer, he knew what God had already told uh, the woman. God at some time there told her, you know, what she could and could not eat. And then he already knew what God had told. Don't know if he was in, uh, sneaking, <laughs> uh, sneaking around or what, but anyway, he knew uh, that that had already been done. And so, shall not eat from blank tree. Uh, my version had the word any. Also, the word every tree could be. So, any or every tree. Of course, we know, uh, as we'll see after we get through here in another verse or so, that there is a, um, um, a restriction on what they could eat from. Now, if you remember back in our earlier two chapters, we did learn about the fact of trees being uh, created by God out of the dust of the earth, and, and they could make fruit, and then they would have seeds so they could grow new trees and so forth like that. Uh, where was the tree that man and woman could not eat from or touch? Uh, in the middle of the garden. In the middle of the garden. So if we stop and think just for a moment, in the middle of a garden is a tree. Do not know how big it was or anything like that. We do get some description of it a little bit later in this chapter, but we don't know what size. Um, I, we know that it did fruit. I know for many, many years we've always heard about the apple. There's, nowhere in the Scripture does it say apple. 
So that's an incorrect thing. Don't know who started that. Probably, probably an artist. Maybe th- uh, five, six, eight hundred years ago may have drawn, uh, painted a picture and may have put an apple on a tree. That may have been how it started. I don't know. But by Scripture, what the Scripture tells us, we do not know. We know it was a fruit, uh, so we don't know anything after that. But it was in the middle of the garden, so guess what? If they were outside of the garden and were going to the middle of the garden, guess what all they had to walk by? All the other fruit trees, all the other good things that we could have. But in the middle is where it said we could not have. And sadly, mankind, quite often, uh, you can tell us a thousand things we can do, but don't tell us that one we can't do. If you tell us that one, guess what mankind wants to do? That's probably the one they want to do. It is just, uh, sadly, uh, a problem for us. We hope, but, but we will, hopefully we'll remember that all the things that they went by food-wise and they could eat and never have to go to the middle of the garden. They wouldn't have to go there. They had all the other things for them. And so I thought that was a neat thing to think of right there. Now, uh, now the next question, number four, what word did the serpent add to the Lord's, Lord God's statement about eating from the tree in the middle of the garden? It's found in verse four. A three-letter word, the word not. The word not. You will not surely die. God said, you will surely die. He said four words. Satan said five. And that was the downfall of mankind in that sense, in the fact that then our Savior Jesus Christ was then put on the, in other words, put in to the play, so to speak, to where he would have to come, live that life to give us the opportunity to have home in heaven. Question number five, the serpent said to the woman, serpent said to the woman that you, uh, that you eat from the tree, you will be like what? The serpent said to the woman that God knows in the day that you eat from the tree, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Up until that time, Guess what man knew, only knew what was good up until the eating of the fruit. Everything that he would have known, it insinuates that here, that everything that he would have known would have been good. Did not know anything was wrong. We have to remember uh, at this particular time when they were in the garden like this, uh, they were not wearing any covering on their body because there was no sin between man and woman. It was a natural way to be. And so it did not seem to be wrong uh, in that sense. But um, God knows good and evil is what he knows. That's why he was trying, and then no doubt trying to uh, have man in such a place, beautiful place to where he would not want to sin, but sadly that happened. So um, knowing if we knew... What, the level of good and evil that God would know, then that would place us upon that level with him. Number six, when the woman looked at the tree, what did she see? And there was three things that she saw, three things. First one was good for food. Again, please remember, we have no idea how many fruit trees, how many amounts of food that she had walked by just to get to that tree. And I'm going to be, uh, I believe that every other tree was good for food too. I know it was, had to be. So it wasn't that this was a special tree. More than likely, (laughs) what she sees in this tree, she has seen already in the trees before she got to it. But she was looking at something that Satan was talking about, is what it was. So first thing was it was good for food that it was a delight to the eyes. It was a delight to the eyes. It was pleasurable. It, it looked nice. It looked beautiful, whatever the word you may want to use, but that's what it was. And then thirdly, desirable to make one wise because the verse before Satan said, 
that if you eat of this, you will be as wise. Uh, you, you, you'll know like God what is good and evil. So he had put that temptation in front of woman at that particular time. Did the woman know that that was a temptation? No, I don't believe so at all. She had no idea. Once she ate it, then she would have known what it was. But those three things, what was good for food, it's delightful to the eye and desirable to make one wise. If there was something to eat could do all that, wouldn't you want to eat it too? It, it's, it, you know, human nature says we'd want to do that too, but uh, that was the three things that, which she had. Where was Adam when Eve was talking with the serpent? <clears throat> you know, a lot of times, to be honest with you, uh, it's not this, that Eve took a bum rap for this or get the blame for it. Uh, because if you read verse 6, you'll find out that he was standing there with her. He was there with her. Read that whole verse and you'll see. Uh, Adam was not in another part of the garden and she has to go get him. And he, he, then he could say, you, sh uh, you shouldn't have done that. I, I would have told you not to. He was there with her. So whether it was the fact was that she was talking to the serpent uh, and Adam wasn't at that time, but he could have spoke up and said no. He could have st stepped up and said no. Again, he did not know about evil at that time. Um, just they should have listened to what God had said. If you eat of this tree, you will die. And not listen to where Satan said, you can eat of this tree and you will not die. And so that's what happened. So he was there with her. So uh, remember that. They were both, uh, sadly, uh, had an opportunity to make a good decision. Neither one of them did. After they both ate, both ate of the fruit, what happened? What happened? In verse 7 it says this, The eyes of both of them were open. The eyes of both of them were open. And sadly at that point in time, whenever that was, at that moment, then man realized um, that uh, a sin had just gotten into mankind at that particular time. What did they see? When their eyes were opened, in verse 7 it says that they were naked, that they, they had no clothing on. Up until that moment, it was not an issue. Um, and uh, that particular time then, the dis particular type desires that can be in human beings now uh, could start being creeped in at that particular time, that they were naked. Uh, what did they do next in verse 7? They sewed fig leaves together. At that particular moment, they knew that they needed to cover themselves up. Now, it was, it was only between them two people, Adam and Eve. There was no one else at that time. And so uh, to do that, though, um, uh, they, they took leaves, fig leaves, and sewed them together. What uh, did they make as they sew in this? What did they make? A uh, loin or girdles covering. A loin covering or girdle covering is what it would have been some form and fashion of that. What did man and woman do when they heard the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day? This is in verse 8. In verse 8, first of all, we see that they both heard God walking in the garden. Now, I don't know if God was whistling, singing, talking, or whatever it would have been that would have caused them to realize uh, that God was coming. And, it, and we don't know exactly what form and fashion he would have been to see them. We just don't know. Um, uh, that is something, you know, that you, we have to remember that um, when we start trying to, our human mind trying to understand God, it's just not within our realm to do that. I don't believe so. We can know some things about him, but, you know, the, phys the appearance of him and the form of him and all like that, we just do not know. But when they heard him, look what they did. They hid themselves. They hid themselves. When you hide from someone, what does that mean? It means, number one, that you probably did something wrong. You know you did something wrong, and you feel as though that they're fixing to punish you or get on to me, or want to know why I did that, or whatever it might be. Um, also, it could be that I realize that I did something, I'm ashamed of it, what it might be. 
and uh, that I, I know now I should have never done whatever it was, but I did anyway, and I'm sorry for that, maybe. But they hid themselves. Uh, where did woman, a man and woman hide in verse 8? Among the trees of the garden. You know, it's kind of sad, a uh, sad uh, thing here. They had to walk through the garden, all those trees to get to the center of the garden, and then they had to run back away from the center to hide. It's what they did. And so they hid, hid from God. And then, uh, one of the things, one of the times that we, that we have recorded something that God says uh, right off the bat in the, in the early beginnings of Genesis, then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, and said to him, where are you? Where are you? You ever go into a room or outside of something and your child's supposed to be nearby and you say that very same thing, where are you? Or uh, you may say, we're not playing high go seat. You better get out of here where I can see you because you're panicking a lot of times. The, uh, the, uh, one of the worst feelings I know I've ever had, I'd be out somewhere when the kids were small and I, and I sense you lose them, that moment of panic, and you don't know where they are. I don't know if that's, I know it's happened to you, but it's uh, that's that moment, particularly in the world we live in today, you just don't know, and you just go nuts trying to find them, and so forth like that. Uh, don't know if God felt that same way about mankind at that moment, but he did ask an appropriate question, where are you? So that means that they normally would, I guess, appear uh, to God any time he would come into the garden. But this was the first time that God said, where are you now? Did God not know where they were? No, he knew where they were. Uh, but for man himself, uh, that uh, this applies to the man, that, again, that he is hiding from the one that created him and loves him. In Genesis 3 and 11, God said, Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Commanded you not to eat. God already knew he already ate that. But by asking this question, what did man have to do? Man and woman. They had to admit what they had done. So command you not to eat. says, have you done that? Who did man blame for him eating from the tree? This reminds me so much of teenagers when they get in trouble, or even little kids. The first one that speaks up is always going to take the blame themselves. Well, it was me. No. What are they going to do? Same thing that man did. Blame someone else, <laughs> not himself. Now, it says woman. Now, who did man blame for him eating from the tree? Now, it is true Scripture tells us that Eve gave Adam fruit to eat, and he did eat it. But again, he was there with her, and he could have told her and himself not to eat of that, but he didn't. So he blamed woman. Well, here's God, asked man, then woman is blamed. And then in uh, Genesis 13, who did the woman blame? The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So you had God ask this question, just like a parent would today, whatever the question might be. And then if there was five <laughs> children, more than likely, four of them are going to say it was somebody else. And sadly, that last one, they're going to try to throw it back on who? Somebody else that just said it was them. And so you see, see that happening. But she did say, that the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So we do know that in the, in the time of creating and so forth like that, that the serpent, which we uh, see here, uh, was there. He was in the garden. The, now, as we see the term serpent there, we normally, serpent would be a snake, um, deceived me, and I ate. Um, you know, a lot. you may see paintings and so forth, having a serpent up, uh, in, with Adam and Eve in the tree, you may see that. But, um, but she did say, even though he deceived me, I did eat, is what I did. 
in Genesis 3 and 14 lists four things that the Lord God said to the serpent. Now, we, ha we know by now that uh, sadly sin had creeped into mankind. And so then God said some things to the serpent. And cursed are you more than all of the cattle and more than every beast of the field. That's one thing he said. Cursed are you. So he, is, he, was, he was cursed more than cattle and more than every beast of the field. Also, on your belly shall you go. On your belly shall you go. And so that would signify there of being that form of a, of a snake at that particular time. Of course, we know later in the New Testament we hear about Satan going about as a roaring lion. Uh, that's a figurative way of sh saying a roaring lion would go around devouring anything they can. And that's what sin does. Sin does that to me. So that's two things. Thirdly, and dust shall you eat. Uh, if that serpent is on the ground crawling around, then he's going to be with the dust and the dust uh, that you uh, shall eat. And then all the days of your life, whatever the life would be of Satan, however long that may be, then that's what he will be. So he's, those are some things that God said about him in the verse 14. Uh, what did the Lord God put between the serpent and the woman? Uh, and the word enmity is what he did. Put that between them. And uh, so we, we have that. So there is something between the two there. Um, in verse 20, it says, The Lord God said this, He shall blank. Now, and that word bruise. He shall bruise you on the head. Now, we're going to stop right there just for a moment. If you notice in this, when God spoke this, the word he, H-E, is capital. Um, at to start off with there. But he then would represent... Jesus Christ, and that's what Jesus will do when Jesus himself is put on the cross. When Jesus is put on the cross and gives his life up, he does that. Up until then, there was no hope for man uh, to have his forgiveness of his sins, uh, and so we had to have the perfect sacrifice of Jesus, and so he came and did that. And that, if you notice, bruising the head there. Now, let's look at the rest. And you shall bruise him on the heel. The heel of the foot is as far away from the most important part of the body as far as uh, thinking and so forth, and that's the brain. Now, if you'll notice, it says that Jesus will bruise Satan on the head. And so, and a blow to the head is death. A severe enough blow to a head is death. And that's what would have happened on the cross, when Jesus rose, uh, was, uh, died, put in the grave, and the third day rose, arose to be um, eventually with God in heaven, that right there was that sacrifice that had been given for mankind that, that Jesus did. And so that then took away, if man wants it to be, if they're willing to do what God wants us to do, then the fact of the sin, as long as we try our best not to sin uh, or ask for forgiveness when we do, then we can have a home in heaven. And uh, that's the beauty of what Jesus did for us. But in the third chapter, the third chapter of Genesis, Jesus, an, an inference to him was put in at verse 15, right there. So mankind, as they read, even back, way back as they were reading the book of Genesis, and they could see that someone was coming that would be able to defeat Satan. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. Now, we do not know uh, if, if there had not been any sin, if uh, when she had a child, if there would be any pain or not, but we know now in that it would be. Um, and it may have been, because it has the word multiply, I just don't know. But that's in verse 16, 16. Because Adam listened to his wife, what did the Lord God say about the ground? 
what he said, in his cursed is the ground. Now, do not know, all we can, uh, all we can do is speculate in this, but I believe this is, would be true. The earth prior to the sin could grow, produce better than it could have ever do even today. And so mankind would have had the perfect place. It wouldn't have been much work or anything, but we will see next week of what happens when the ground was cursed. So if you out there chopping up uh, them old stinky onions on the ground or those briars and stuff, you know who to blame now. Oh, Adam. <laughs> Thank you all very much for our class today. We enjoyed it. Have a good day.